You know, I wish this theme of the debate had been couched as a dialogue more than a debate. Then instead of trying to knock our opponents down, we could have jointly thought together on the problems that bedevil, that are, that constitute the substance of our political predicament. So I am not going to begin by refuting the other side. There is no other side in politics. There is only collaboration, cooperation, dialogue, debate, and a willingness to convert the others to your point of view and change your own point of view in light of their criticism. The idea is not a zero-sum game of who wins and who loses. Politics is very important. We need dialogue. We do not need debates. We do not, above all, need leaders who fling out their arms like Shah Rukh Khan in a romantic film and abuse their opponents, mock their opponents. We need well-reasoned participants of the public, of the citizens of India, to think together how we can get out of the predicament of politicization of identity. Let me get this very clear. The fact that we belong to a religious or a caste group is a sociological phenomenon. It's a part of the way a society is made up. We all belong to groups. The fact that that identity becomes a basis for making demands upon the body politic is a political phenomenon. Because politics is about making demands. The fact that we belong to a particular group doesn't make political sense. The fact that we use that group identity to push agendas makes political sense. So I, first of all, I would like to clarify this distinction between belonging to a group as a sociological category and this di distinction and the fact that we use that group belonging to place specific demands we may or may not have anything in common with the rest of our society the second part of the distinction. If you look at this quote from the Supreme Court judgment, it highlights one very important factor that maybe or maybe not I, as a political theorist, should be putting before law students. The source of morality is not law. Law is the outcome of morality. Morality should not is morality. The fact that the talk of candidates speaks of a very narrow notion of democracy that is only electoral democracy. First, I have 10 quick points to make, and I hope to make them more one minute a point before my 10 minutes end. The first question to ask is, what is the relationship between representation and democracy? And I'm going to concentrate on representation because this is the theme at hand. Please remember in history, representation precedes democracy. Look at our own colonial history. Elizabeth would have to, will have told you this in class. It happened in England. It happened everywhere in the world that groups were represented in decision-making processes before the doors of those assemblies were thrown open to the ordinary men and women like you and me. So we have to think about why representation is integral to democracy and why, what is the status of the representative? The first point is the status of the representative is derivative. The real possessors of sovereignty are the people of India. Of course, the people is a bit of a political fiction. It's kind of replaced the divine right of king, but it is a useful fiction to have in a democracy. The representative, therefore, is not, not ruled by virtue of a divine right of kings. He or she rules because we have elected him to represent <coughs> our interests, our needs, our opinion, our ideologies in decision-making forums. She is obliged to do so. She is also in a position to get something done about our needs, upon our aspirations, about our opinions, and she is accountable to us. She is accountable for our, to us for what she has or she has not done in the last five years or four years, as the case might be. Now, this territorial theory of representation assumes 
Some people vote for the representative, some do not. But the representative, if it's elect, he or she is elected, will represent all, irrespective of those who did or did not vote for her. There was a problem with this theory in the 1990s, and we started thinking of the politics of voice, of the politics of presence, of the politics of identity, because these processes of representation were not representing the voiceless. They were not representing the double disadvantage, those who are disadvantaged by reasons of both caste and class and religious minority. There are two kinds of division in society. There is a horizontal division along the lines of caste in every religious community, and there's a vertical division among different religious communities. So let's get everybody in. The problem is three problems quickly. Do I have two minutes or five minutes? Two. Five minutes, okay. We have now in place a firmly entrenched literature on the politics of presence. And there were two or three very many problems that came up with this solution to the crisis of democracy, the crisis of representation. Firstly, please understand, the representative by the fact of being voted into power acquires tremendous power. There is no pre-political, <coughs> sorry, pre-political will that he or she represents. Not only does she create the will, particularly after the advent of political parties, she shapes and molds the political will. Well, I hate saying she, maybe I should say he. They mold and shape our political will. They tell us what is important. Is it more important in India to save the cow, or is it more important to save infants? Think about priorities. When a party represents a group, this is what happens. And when that group has an imaginary unity, this is what happens. The notion of Hinduism, Elizabeth was quite right, is a 19th century construct. It is a construct of Orientalism. The notion of Islam in the late 19th century is, an, is a colonial construct by the codification of laws. Yes, and by Sir Said Ahmad Khan, who was a modernist. Islam was a loosely articulated notion of, of, of groups, as were Hindus, as were Sikhs. So what is being represented? That is important. Think about it. Is it more important to keep watch on what people eat and drink? Because you're a Hindu, you feel people should not drink or eat beef, so others also must not eat and eat. What kind of a democracy is this? This happens when you represent people, yes. Secondly, via the fact of representation, we see the, middle, the uh, making of a power elite in every ethnic group. Let us not dispute it. Who do they represent? There is no empirical proof to show that people, if people are represented on the basis of their religion or their caste, they work well, hard, and successfully for the interests of their caste or their religious groups. Otherwise, we would not have the Dalits and the Muslims, the poorest in the country. If representatives had performed their role well, if they were representatives only of a community. And finally, we lead to an issue that my previous speaker foregrounded very sharply. We lose to lead to the problem of ghettoization. Where is your political community? You know, if somebody's human rights are violated, <clears throat> the citizens of India should be feeling powerfully about this. There should be a sense of outrage. There should be a sense of injustice. Are we standing up for them? No, because their own caste leaders or their own religious leaders are looking after it. We continue with our business as if their welfare is not our welfare. Finally, what group representation has done is to divide civil society as the realm of associations into castes, sub-castes, so many castes coming up for reservations, landed castes coming up for reservations. This is a spiraling effect, and you're facing an authoritarian state. 
your civil society is divided, and your state is authoritarian. Finally, I'm not suggesting nothing should be done for the doubly disprivileged, but only those who are doubly disprivileged, those who are disprivileged by reasons of class and caste, not for everybody and sundry. Thank you.